I thought, I have an interior design degree, man. I am awesome. But I didn't know I needed a degree in marketing. I needed a degree in website development, you know. And I, I needed a degree in psychology, for Christ's sakes. I mean, it was just like everything. Have you hit a wall when it comes to growing your business? Then welcome to the Wingnut Social Podcast, helping home professionals and luxury brands accelerate their success with proven marketing strategies and expert industry practices. Now, here's your host, Darla Powell. BuildLane is a platform that makes it super easy for designers to specify custom furniture. They are changing the game. The end result is an unleashing of your creativity Whatever you can imagine can be built. And whether or not you're a novice at custom furniture design or an expert, Build Lane's team can make the process super easy. Head on over to buildlane.com. That's buildlane.com. Use code WINGNUT250 to get a $250 discount just for you. Buildlane.com. Hey, this is Darla from Wingnut Social. Wingnut Social is a marketing agency for the interior designers. And I know something about that because I am an interior designer. And when I was doing full-time design in Miami, Florida, my social media marketing made all the difference in bringing me leads and clients. And not only that, but broadening my awareness, my reach, my brand awareness, and keeping me top of mind for clients when they were ready to pull that trigger on my interior design services. And right now I know you guys are super, super busy. But we all know that it's not going to last forever. So it's very important to keep top of mind and keep that pipeline stoked for when this super unprecedented busy design season decides to, you know, go away, to do the opposite. And right now we have two slots left open for our full service digital marketing before we close enrollment for the fall and reopen it back sometime in December. So two spots left open for our full service social media marketing. We are busy, busy, busy. We have a waiting list. And that is because we have a very low churn rate. And what a churn rate means in the industry is, you know, someone comes in, someone goes out, someone comes in, someone goes out and sales has to, you know, churn has to keep on top of it. Well, at Wingness Social, nobody leaves. (laughs) Nobody leaves which is a testament to the job that we do for our clients. As a matter of fact, you can go to wingnutsocial.com, check out the case studies at the very top navigation, and you can see some of the results that we've managed to achieve for our clients while doing their digital marketing. Head on over to wingnutsocial.com or give us a call at 786-206-4331. We'll be happy to help you out. Hey there, welcome to the Wingnut Social Podcast. I'm your host, Darla Powell. I am the grand high poobah of all things here at Wingnut Social, a marketing agency for interior designers and adjacent verticals. Today's show, we have Kathleen Jennison of KTJ Design Co. on. Kathleen has a really, really interesting story. She went through some serious trauma, like action movie, John Wick style trauma, And that led her to change careers from an accountant to an interior designer. I think you guys are going to find her story inspirational. But not even just that. She has been in business in the interior design industry, learning the hard way, like all hard-headed people do. (laughs) That's a compliment because I am also hard-headed, Kathleen. What to do and what not to do in her interior design firm, since she's going to share those hard knock stories with you. So if you're out there thinking, hey, I want to switch careers and become an interior designer, or if you're thinking of starting your business, or if you're new into your business, you might recognize some of these mistakes and the corrections that she made to correct them at the risk of being redundant, and some of the positive things that she's done that's helped to uh, increase her bottom line. So I'm excited to get into my conversation and have you hear Kathleen Jennison's story, but before that happens, y'all know what time it is. Time for Men in News, Men in News Sesh. Yeah. yeah. Welcome back to the show, Emily Lisi. Today we're talking all about Instagram map search. And am I right in thinking that when I was in Savannah recently on vacation, that this could have been so helpful to discover things that I could have done nearby? Yeah, for sure, because this is a new feature that Instagram is testing, not testing in the U.S. yet. But what it will be is there will be a little map icon at the top right of your discovery tab Okay. in Instagram, and it will highlight different places like cafes and restaurants, things like shops and entertainment venues. So this is a great feature specifically for brick and mortar type 
businesses. I love that. When we were just there in Savannah, we were trying to find a really decent ghost tour. But we had just had to use, you know, Google near me and kind of thing. This would be really helpful for someone who has their Instagram game on point with the marketing there. What do businesses have to do to make sure they get discovered in that tab? Instagram will let you put in things like your hours, your address, pricing info on your products, and it will also link to your Instagram profile. So this will be another great way for people to, you know, explore your Instagram profile and follow you potentially. Oh, okay. It'll also show a, a grid display of people who have visited that location and tagged you. So that's really good exposure for your company as well. And I see here that you have that location stories are coming back. I, what are location stories? I think that's one I missed. So last year, Instagram actually took that away. It had been a thing for years where when you tag a story with a location, when someone searches for that location on Instagram, it would show you, you would be able to tap the little story bubble of that location and view people's stories that are tagged with that location. So right now you can't do that anymore. Ever since last year around the election, they took it away for whatever reason. And they also took away hashtag stories. So right now when you put hashtags in your stories, it really doesn't do anything for the past year. Oh, okay. Hashtags don't do anything in your stories, but hopefully this means that hashtag story discovery will be coming back as well. I'm hoping that that will be the case. Yeah, that'll be super helpful. I put in hashtags all the time. I'm looking for stuff for home theater design, all kinds of things. And you're right. I'm not getting any results in the stories or anything, really. So, all right. Cool. Good to know. Thanks again, Emily. Yeah. Man in new sash. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, Emily. Let's get into my interview with Kathleen Jennison. Kathleen had an unexpected and traumatic circumstance. It gave her one of two options, live her life by design or live it by default. She chose the former and has never looked back. Wingnuts, help me in welcoming Kathleen Jennison to the show. Hey there, Kathleen Jennison. Welcome to the podcast. How the hell are you? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for asking. Oh, very welcome. I'm so excited to have you on the show today. When you reached out to be on the podcast, your story intrigued me incredibly. And this is uh, your second career as an interior designer. So you and I have that going for us, but you have definitely a different story. So before we we dig into some of the mistakes that you've made, so we can tell newbies getting into the interior <laughs> design business, you know, I'm gonna give them a heads up, maybe save them some time and money. Tell me a little bit about your incident that led you to being an interior designer and then those obstacles that you overcame. Yeah. So it was back in 2006. I was a uh, financial statement auditor working for a big accounting firm. And we had had our strategic meeting retreat in Napa, California. And the last day was a day of golf and I was on the first round. So I got done early and I was headed back to a uh, home and I decided to take the scenic route. It was in Napa. So it's a beautiful area. It was a very windy, windy road. And I came around a hairpin turn and there was a car park taking pictures and to avoid that car, I went over to try to go to the side of the road and it was gravelly dirt and I just went over the cliff ravine. Anyway, I fell oh my God. 200 feet into the ravine. <gasps> and yeah, so the last thing I remember going over the edge is the airbag deploying out of my steering wheel and thinking to myself, this is not going to be good. <laughs> and that's the last oh thing I remember. Gosh. Yeah. Wow. My hands are sweating hearing that story. So, okay. So where'd you wake up? In the hospital, I'm assuming. So yeah, they plucked me out of the ravine, put air flighted me to several hospitals. I ended up at UC Davis Medical Center and I had traumatic brain injuries. I lost the vision in my right eye, broke many, many bones, had many, many surgeries. And it was very difficult because I had a uh, short-term memory loss. So I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, 50 First States with, um, like, <laughs> yes. yeah, where she wakes up every day and she doesn't know what happened. Drew That's Barrymore. how I was. Yeah, Drew Barrymore. And my husband would be sitting there and I'm like, why am I here? What's happening? And he would tell me. And luckily for me, my short-term memory came back pretty much intact. And I slowly began to remember things, but I kind of had to learn uh, how to find my words. So I would know... And I still kind of do this a little bit. I would know what something is, but I wouldn't know the name of it. So for instance, and this was months after I got out of the hospital, I was home and 
my husband was going to the grocery store and I, he said, I'm going to the store. What do you want? And I said, you know, I want this thing and it's like little flakes and they have sugar on them and there's a tiger on the box, but I don't know what it's called. He's like, Frosted Flakes? I'm like, yeah, Frosted Flakes. That's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> so, Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're here and you seem to be hale and hearty and you're alive. Goodness gracious, what an yeah. ordeal to go through. So you were in accounting when this happened. You wake up in the hospital, you go through all these surgeries, you go, I'm assuming, all kinds of physical therapy, all kinds of stuff. How how many years did it take you to get you functioning to start doing your interior design firm? And what the hell made you think from accounting to interior design with this incident that happened? Yeah, so I was going through to a lot of cognitive rehabilitation and it wasn't going so well. And also since I lost the vision in my right eye, I lost my peripheral vision. So separately, my ophthalmologist and my neurologist in the same week strangely said, you know, you need to learn something new. My neurologist said, you're doing all this therapy, but the best thing you could do is learn something new. And my ophthalmologist said, you know, you need to maybe take an art class because the function of putting pen to paper will help you with your depth perception. So I was like, okay. So my husband and I investigated art schools and I found the Art Institute and they had a drafting class coming up the next semester. And I thought, oh, architectural drafting, that sounds pretty cool. I I think I'll try that. So I had gone back to work part-time, but it wasn't going so well. I was not able to do the work that I had done before. Mm -hmm. And as my neurologist explained, I hadn't lost any of my intelligence. It's just that my brain wiring was different. And I was doing physical therapy at that time. And my physical therapist, I told her, I'm like, you know, I just, I feel different about things. Like, I feel like I want to paint. And she's like, yeah, sometimes people's brain switches. You know, she says, you were an analytical math person. And so your brain just switched to the other side. And she says, some. Sometimes that happens. I'm like, okay, so all this is happening at the same time. I take the drafting class and it was so difficult. Like every day I literally cried, but um, I just fell in love with it. And then the next semester came along and I took uh, fundamentals of interior design and color theory. And I thought, oh, I kind of like this. And so I had been back to work for about a year. This was about two years after the accident. And I decided to just quit my job and go back to school full time and um, not full time. I mean, I already had a degree, a degree in business, so I didn't need to take any general ed or anything. And so I was just taking the classes related to interior design. And before I knew it, I had a degree in interior design and it was totally unintentional. And I thought, okay, now what do I do? (laughs) And at that time it was, you know, right after the recession and there was no jobs. I mean, there was really super talented designers that had been laid off and weren't working. And I probably sent out a hundred resumes and I think I had one interview. And so I thought, well, you know, I'm an accountant. I know how to start a business and I know how to write an invoice and, you know, I know how to set up processes and systems and I think I'll just start my own interior design business. What could go wrong, right? <laughs> yeah, what, what could go wrong? <laughs> so when did you, when did you finally launch your interior design business? Was in 2011. Oh, okay. So happy anniversary. You, you, yeah, 10 yes, years. thank or, you. 10 years. It did not go, though, like I thought it was. <laughs> We are uh, veteran. We're veterans. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, uh, as you found out, interior design industry is just all over the place as far as nothing to standardize, you know, the, the fees, the contracts, um, you know, and I had to figure that all on my own because I had no experience, practical experience. But um, I I mean, I did have my business experience. So I knew that it was important to have a contract. I knew that it was important to get paid. And and, and I didn't have problems asking people for money because I had to do that in my previous career. So I had that going for me. But, you know, I I thought, oh, this is, I have an interior design degree, man. I am awesome. But I didn't know I needed a degree in marketing. I needed a degree in website development, you know, and I I needed a degree in psychology for Christ's (laughs) sakes. I mean, it was just like everything. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. Okay. So what we're going to do now, Kathleen, first of all, again, so happy that you made it through and that led you to a career that I'm assuming you love, right? I do. Right. I mean, there are days like all of us have with it that sure, sure, sure. you just want to, you know. Kill clients. Yes, I know. I'll say it. You don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so in your 10 years of hard knock learning, and I did the same thing with Darla Palantir's, went through, it was a very expensive education, made mistakes, 
learn the hard-headed hard way, right? Yeah. So let's lead some of the people in the audience might be thinking, you know, I want to quit my career as a rodeo clown and I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to be an interior designer. Let's walk them through some of the things that they should do and shouldn't do. And we'll start off with the negatives. What are some of the mistakes that you made that you can warn these uh, potential interior design business owners about? So back when I started, I mean, I got, I have a whole library full of books and um, there were no podcasts. There were no, a lot of Facebook things. There was not a lot of coaches. So I kind of had to figure it out on my own. But the first big mistake that I did, I knew I needed a website. I had taken a class in college where we kind of made our own funky website. That wasn't going to cut it. So I hired a web designer, but he was not in the interior design trade. So we didn't understand that. So my first advice would be, yes, you need a website, but you need to hire someone who is familiar or specializes in doing websites for only interior designers. And they know what they're doing because he was a website developer, but he wasn't going to do the design. And I didn't know that I needed a design person. And then (laughs) <laughs> he kind of did the SEO. And so he's like, well, you need to hire an SEO person. And I'm like, <sighs> I thought it was just one person, you know. So so I didn't know all that stuff. Spent a lot of money. and But I finally did get a good website. And it wasn't until probably about five years ago that I actually then hired a website designer that was for interior designers only. Had kind of piecemealed it together. So that's really important. That's terrific advice. And I did the same thing. I hired a a website designer when I was first starting out who was a a great website designer, but just not well-versed in the whole interior design situation. Since then, I hired Curio Electro, Nicole Heimer over there. And Curio Electro, who's an amazing website designer, she did our Wingnut Social website. And, you know, I'm just like, ah, why couldn't I have uh, just done this from the get-go? Yeah, I would have saved yeah. a lot of time and, and actually a lot of money. Sometimes when you're going and you're trying to save some money, you're actually spending more money in the long run. Yes, exactly. That's terrific advice. What else would you say? Social media. <laughs> <laughs> oh, What are we going to say here, Kathleen? <laughs> again, again, you need to hire someone that's a specialist in social media for interior designers. Yeah. So I did know that I, I didn't know anything about Facebook. Facebook was just a new thing. Instagram wasn't even around. Forget TikTok, you know, that was stuff wasn't around. So I hired this gal and she, I'm still kind of unwinding what she did. She created 12 Facebook pages and 12 Twitter pages. <laughs> and she was going to post stuff for me every day. Oh my and, God. And I'm still trying to close those out. I think there's still a few Twitters that she created that I don't know the password to. <laughs> <laughs> and she was going to, you know, post things every day, but all she did was repost something that someone else posted and sending them to those people's website. And I'm like, after a few months, I'm like, this is not working out. So definitely hire someone to set up your social media if you don't know what you're doing. And even if you do know what you're doing, get someone that specializes in interior designer. And even if you only hire them for three months, at least they will show you what to do. And you don't need someone, you don't need to outsource it and have them do every little thing. You just need someone to get you set up properly. That's the most important thing is to get set up properly. I love that you said that too. You know, of course, Wingnut Social is a marketing agency for interior designers, but you might not be at the level of your business to where you want to completely delegate everything. Maybe you don't have the budget to do that for marketing, but if you could consult with an agency like Wingnut Social or or another agency to just make sure you get everything set up so you don't have 15 Twitter pages. You can get into your Facebook business account. (laughs) I can't tell you how many interior designers come to us and they're like, "Um, I haven't been able to get into my Facebook business manager for years because I had someone run it five years ago and I haven't had the login and and things just aren't set up correctly. And it's a little bit of a nightmare for us to fix. So, and again, that's going back to the, the other point is you may think you're saving money in the beginning, but in the long run, you're not. You're kind of throwing money away. And I always like to say, I mean, as interior designers, I mean, you're making way more than marketers. You know, you're making $200, 300 400 sometimes $500 an hour. Why would you waste your time at that hourly rate, you know, getting on there and throwing crap on Instagram once you get to that point? Right. And if you're just putting crap out there that's not doing you any good, you're wasting more than just your time. You're wasting money because... It's worthless. So get someone to teach you how to do it the right way. And because if you're going to do it, you you need to make sure it works. And it does work. It does work. So are you finding you're getting leads from your social media marketing? Yes, I do. What, do you, what is yeah. your biggest, what's your best platform for that? I think Instagram. Yeah. 
And blogging. I, I oh, blog. Yeah. yeah, that's a really, that's a good one to punch. And so, but people, when I go on my consultations, they're like, oh, I saw that post on such and such, and, you know, or I'll go to the consultation and they'll say to me, well, you said blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, wait a minute, I've just been here 10 <laughs> minutes. And then it dawns on me, oh, they're reading my blog where yep. I said that. Yep. And I'm like, okay, so it does work. Isn't it, it funny? You know what I find? And I've talked to this with guests and clients before that the people that end up hiring us from social media are nine times out of 10, the people who are just stalking us and don't even, don't even engage or comment. You're just like, <laughs> they hit you out of, out of left field. Just like, Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. I do have that marketing going on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Sometimes I get discouraged because I'm like, is anybody even reading this? And then that happens and I'm like, okay, it does work. And it's great for your SEO. So yeah, blogging is the number one thing you can do for your SEO. Once you you know you have your website in shape, and every time I put out a kitchen blog, kitchen design blog, guess what phone calls would come in for me to design a kitchen? <laughs> yeah, Sandra, my lead designer, will start getting all these calls about one the living room or the kitchen, and she's like, "What are you blogging about now? We're getting all these calls." <laughs> I'm yeah. like, "Well, if you read them, you'll know." <laughs> yeah, yeah, come on, Sandra. <laughs> Have you visited our sponsor, buildlane.com? If you haven't, why haven't you? You know, when I was doing full-time interior design in Miami, Florida, I would have given my whole collection of Star Wars action figures to have known about Build Lane because we were doing a buttload of custom furniture work. The logistics were awful, but Build Lane, the genius behind them is they've solved that. They are basically a one-stop shop for all of your custom furniture needs. They have a whole stable full of vetted vendors that are capable of building almost anything you can imagine. And all you have to do is give them a fully specified CAD file or a pencil drawing on a cocktail napkin. And Build Lane is going to match the needs of the piece that you need with one of their highly vetted factories that has all the capabilities to make that. And they'll return a quote to you. You get your own little manager. You can show your clients, here is your beautiful piece getting built along the way. Aren't you freaking excited? Guys, this is the perfect opportunity to up-level your interior design game to make yourself that designer who can offer things that no other designer can. You need to get over to buildlane.com fast. And be sure to use the special code WINGNUT250 for $250 off of that whole situation right there. That's buildlane.com, wingnut250. You're going to love them. Hey, this is Darla from Wingnut Social. Wingnut Social is a marketing agency for the interior designers. And I know something about that because I am an interior designer. And when I was doing full-time design in Miami, Florida, my social media marketing made all the difference in bringing me leads and clients. And not only that, but broadening my awareness, my reach, my brand awareness, and keeping me top of mind for clients when they were ready to pull that trigger on my interior design services. And right now, I know you guys are super, super busy. But we all know that it's not going to last forever. So it's very important to keep top of mind and keep that pipeline stoked for when this super unprecedented busy design season decides to, you know, go away, to do the opposite. And right now we have two slots left open for our full service digital marketing before we close enrollment for the fall and reopen it back sometime in December. So two spots left open for our full service social media marketing. We are busy, busy, busy. We have a waiting list. And that is because we have a very low churn rate. And what a churn rate means in the industry is, you know, someone comes in, someone goes out, someone comes in, someone goes out and sales has to, you know, churn has to keep on top of it. Well, at Wingnut Social, nobody leaves. <laughs> nobody leaves, which is a testament to the job that we do for our clients. As a matter of fact, you can go to wingnutsocial.com, check out the case studies at the very top navigation, and you can see some of the results that we've managed to achieve for our clients while doing their digital marketing. Head on over to wingnutsocial.com or give us a call at 786-206-4331. We'll be happy to help you out. What other mistakes did you make that you learned from? So I just use a generic accounting software system that most people use. But once I switch to an accounting software that's just for interior designers, and I'm an accountant, so I know how to use an accounting sure. system. And it just streamlined my whole process. And really, I was able to 
scale up my business because of that. It just took a lot of the pressure off and saved me a lot of time. So, you know, there's a lot, not a lot, but there's three or four really good accounting software programs out there for interior designers. And so what do you use? I use um, Studio Designer. Okay. I've heard good things about Studio Designers. I don't have hands-on with it. I know for Darla Powell Interiors, we use my Doma, which was pretty good. But I, there's a lot of uh, good ones out there right now, right? you got Studio Designer, my Doma. See, there's a, there's another big one I'm forgetting. Yeah, Designer something. something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a testimonial for you. <laughs> there's quite a few, but there's, they're good. Yeah. So Designer Link, that's what I was Designer thinking. Link. Okay. I haven't heard of that one. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, that seems like something like, ah, oh, that's not necessary. I don't really need that. But if you can start off with that from the beginning, what I found, because in the past I, I used one accounting software, it was a project management kind of slash accounting software, ended up not being quite so happy with it, then moved over to my Doma. Translating or transferring that, I should say, was a little bit of a pain in the ass. So if you can find something you like at the get-go that works really well by looking at reviews or whatever. Studio Designer, like you, like you said, is really good. I've heard good things about it. My Dome is great. So yeah, it's good to get in on that at the get-go. Because otherwise you'll just go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already there. Go crazier. Yeah, for sure. All right. Do you have any more mistakes or you want to start getting into the, the good stuff? Well, I have one more little piece of advice. Like I said, when I first started out, there was no podcast and there was very few consultants. Now there's a ton of consultants and gurus and, and consultants for interior designers. And so about three to four or five years ago, you know, I listened to every podcast. I bought every book. I was listening to every guru and I was trying every little thing that they suggested. Oh, okay. I got to do that. So I jump over here. And, oh, okay. I got to do that. And I jump over here. And I, it was just that fear of missing out. And I just realized I need to find the one guru that resonates with me and that works for me and listen to just that one person instead of, it's great to listen to the podcast and get little tidbits here and there, but just don't, don't try to jump on every bandwagon. Just pick one and follow that. And then if it doesn't serve you anymore, then go, yeah, sure. Pick someone else, but don't just try to try everything. I like that advice in that because it, it, there's a lot of noise out there, right? There's a lot of noise. So there's so much. many different coaches, so many different gurus, so much different advice in the interior design space now too, but just in general, so many different, you know, girl boss podcasts or, you know, that you can hear and it, pick a lane, pick someone that you like, and then just kind of streamline that because otherwise you're just going to have noise going in, noise, noise going out, and it's harder to take action because you're just, you're, your mind's just busy just taking everything in yeah. and, and not focusing. I love that. Okay. Yeah. So perfect. Find someone that resonates with you and stick with it. Okay. Now it wasn't all bad. You've done some stuff that's been positive that you would say, yeah, definitely do this. So what do we want to start with there? So one thing that I did at the very beginning is I think, actually, I think I was still in college is I went to the Las Vegas Design Center. Ah, fun. So yeah, go to the markets. It's really important. That first market I went to, like I did had no idea about pricing, how showrooms worked. I just walked in and said, hey, I'm new at this. How does this work? And most of the showrooms are like, you know, put their arms around me. Come on, we'll show you how it works. Explained everything to me, opened some accounts. Some studios like, oh, well, you know, you don't have enough money for us or something like that. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, fine. Go to the next one. But definitely go to the markets just to and get your accounts set up, learn what's out there, take the CEUs that are offered at those. You know, I know it is expensive, but just find the one that's closest to you, whether it's Las Vegas, Dallas, Atlanta, High Point. There's so many New York, just go to something. I agree. And I think it's so important to attend market. First of all, you get an education from, I remember the first market I went to too. I, I was lost in the sauce. I just went, just kind of got the lay of the land, was not that proactive at it. The next one I was doing speaking engagements <laughs> just from all, from the networking and just going in and making the friends and, and getting the lay of the land and building that conference. So the first one, don't like go in there, just just soak it in, just get, you know, this is what it is. This is what it's like, you know, and regroup and have a plan to maybe conquer the next one. But that's how I work. I mean, maybe you want to go in and go crazy from the first one. But the connections that I made there in person with vendors, with other designers, priceless, absolutely yes. priceless. Highly, highly recommend. Terrific, terrific tip. Next you have, this is kind of the bane of my existence as a marketer for interior designers, photography. Yes. <laughs> you would think that we as interior designers would have a lot more good 
photography, <laughs> professional photography of our, our spaces, this is not always the case. Yes. So I started having my very first project I photographed. I photograph every project, basically, even if it's not something that's Architectural Digest uh, caliber, that's fine. Do some close-up shots of the tabletops or, you know, artwork or something. But the first few projects, I, from college, I had known some guys that were do, taking photography, uh, had them do the photos. They weren't that great. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, a few of them were pretty bad. <laughs> But then through the networking in my local area, so that's another thing that I don't have my list, but network in your local area with different businesses. So I found a photographer and he was not a specialist in interior design because, and he doesn't charge me that much. So I have him for photograph everything. And he and I have kind of learned together over the years, or I've, you know, shown him pictures of some really good interior design photography and like, see how they lit this and see how they did that. And he's very amenable to changing and learning as well. And at first he always wanted to do the real estate long shot wide view. And I'm like, no, 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 we got to get in. And so he's learning and he's not that expensive. And so I get every project photograph. That's super important. It's important to show clients your work. It's, it's important to put on your portfolio. It's important for all your social proof to have a well done photography because our industry is visual. I mean, what else is it if it isn't visual, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, I mean, there's of course there's the functional part of interior design, but the wow factor you have to you have to get the photography. You can have the most beautiful room, and if it's shot like crap, it's going to be womp womp. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can have a room, and I I have them on my portfolio that are so so. They're kind of average, but if they're well shot, and they're like wow. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this next one here, I find very intriguing for you, what you have done to help your business. And you have on here, you opened a storefront. I am fascinated. Yes. So I had a home office and that was going well, but everybody always wants to sit on and touch things. And I live far away from San Francisco. I can't easily go to San Francisco to the showrooms there or Sacramento to the showrooms there. So it was hard for me to show people what things were. So I had the opportunity to get a space really cheap. It was in the crappiest part of town, actually kind of a dangerous part of town. I've since moved from there, but it was low rent, fixed it all up and just had a little storefront. So that did two things where I could have people come in and sit on samples that I had in the showroom floor. I could hold my consultations and do my presentations there. I had a place for all my samples. So it was easy for people to look at things. And then also when you work from home, people view it as a hobby. So it just gave me some street cred that, you know, this is a serious business. This is not my hobby. I do have to make money at this. So um, I had that. And then when you have a storefront, you also get deeper discounts on pricing. You get better pricing. You get dealer pricing, stocking dealer pricing. So you get better pricing. So increases your margin. So, you know, then I had a desk. I was able to then hire people and yeah, it just worked out really well. I love that. I've, he I've heard designers say on the forums and the different groups that not only does having an outside showroom or an office out of their home help them, you know, show clients to put their butts in the seats and stuff, but it helps to give them a well-balanced home work-life balance, yes. I should say, because like right now I work from home. And it's so easy for me to just kind of on my lunch break to go down and watch Netflix for five hours. <laughs> <laughs> right? No, but, so they're more productive. True. Yes. And or with me, what I would do is wake up at 2, 2 a.m. and go, oh, I just had a great idea. Run to my computer and start working. And then before I know it, it was 6 a.m. I'm like, yes. oh, I didn't sleep. Uh oh. Same. So or on the weekend. So it, it does set those boundaries for yourself. We've had guests on the show, too, that had a storefront, and they found that it's been a really good business model for their interior design firm where people will come in off the street and they'll see a beautiful piece of furniture or something, and then they are, are given the opportunity to sell them on their design services. Well, you know, you, you know, however, that might organically roll over into, yeah, so... I like that. I've always kind of wanted to do that. Of course, my path led over to doing more the the wingnut social thing for now. But I, I do love that idea of having a business model. And there's a lot of designers who are super successful at doing that. All right. Last but not least, we touched on a little bit in the um, what not to do, but you're about outsourcing. Let's dive in a little more on that. I have outsourced my social media. 
I'm getting ready to outsource. <laughs> Not to us. <clears throat> no, I, but well, I've been doing it myself. I outsourced it and then I brought it back. And so ah, I'm, okay. I'm at the point right now where I'm ready to outsource it again. So I oh, might be okay. contacting you probably. Um, I <laughs> we have a little bit of a wait list, but it's worth it. Yeah. I just outsourced my blog. I outsourced my accounting. That was a big thing for me. Oh, um, wow. Because I, ha- I yeah, held that on to that. Yeah, must have been, right, for you to outsource your accounting. It was really yeah. difficult to make that leap, but just did that back in July. And um, the first month, you know, at the end of the month, she called me and she said, you know, you're still doing everything. And so <laughs> there's nothing for me to do. I'm like, okay, I'll stop doing everything. <laughs> but I, I just couldn't help it. But so, yeah, I, I that's been a big, big help. I always like to say to, you know, delegate outside your scope of genius. I mean, if you have the means, you can afford it. Of course, if you're just beginning in business, there's going to be a, that window there where you're going to have to be doing a lot of hats because you just don't have the income coming in. You you can't delegate as much. But once you can start doing that to those roles that are lesser of an hourly experience than what you could be charging clients or working on your business, highly, highly recommend. Yeah. Kathleen, is there anything I forgot to ask you or anything you want to add before we get into the fire round? I think we covered a lot. <laughs> I think we did. I think yeah. you have some great advice out there. If you have any um, trepidations or fears, at least you can rest a little bit easier not doing some of the mistakes that Kathleen and I have made <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and to incorporate some of the stuff that has worked out really successfully. But now, Kathleen Jennison, I have to ask you, are you ready for the What Up Wingnut round? Oh, yes. <laughs> Why are we whispering? I'm so nervous. <laughs> <laughs> now it's time for What Up Wingnut. Wingnut. What would the hashtag on your tombstone be? Just the facts. Just the facts, ma'am. Yes. I, I'm a very straightforward person. And I just had a client complain to me that she felt that I was rude. But I'm like, because I just get to the point, you know, I don't, in my emails, I don't say, oh, hope you're having a nice day. Hope you had a nice <laughs> week. I just like jump right to the point. And I love it. So just yeah. the facts, ma'am. That's me. Just the facts, ma'am. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? Guy Friday? What was that? No, not Guy Friday. I'm thinking Robinson Crusoe. What was the name of that? I don't that was know. A, what just was the that? facts, ma'am. Oh, it's, it was an old detective show before my time, believe it or not. <laughs> You're stuck on a deserted island, but you can have your one favorite food for ebbs. What is it? I think I'd have to be chicken tacos. I don't know why, but I probably can't have the margaritas with them. So I don't know how good that will go, but. <laughs> I'm having a margarita after the show. You just did it. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love them. Last but not least, please recommend a book that has had a profound impact upon you, either personally or professionally. So I thought about this a long and hard, and I have a big giant library of all kinds of business books and accounting books and uh, interior design books. But the one that affected my life the most personally, and you're going to laugh at this, but... It's a Rick Steves travel guide because in two, <laughs> 2011, my sister and I went to London and Paris and we had these Rick Steve travel guides and we, and you can, I'm showing you that, the, you know, it's all flagged and everything, but I think of that trip all the time. We went for 17 days and it was the most fabulous trip that I've ever had. And the two months prior to the trip, we spent so much time planning using our Rick Steves travel guide. So I think that one affected my life personally the best. It's it's my half sister. So we didn't grow up together and we just decided, you know, we needed to get to know each other better and it really worked and it was a wonderful trip. So that's That's so sweet. I love Rick Steves. I used to watch his show on PBS all the time. The travel, he's so relaxing. So yeah, I used to live vicariously and traveled through Rick Steves. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Kathleen, please tell the listeners where they can go to find out more about you. So they can go to my website. It's KathleenJennison.com. I'm on Instagram and Facebook under the same names. And um, yeah, reach out. If anyone has a question, I'd be happy to help them. All right, Kathleen, thank you so much for joining us. You were amazing. Thank you for having me. I had a great time. So many parallels with Kathleen Jennison and me as far as doing the design business and the mistakes we've made for sure. I, I did not go over a cliff in my car, 200 feet. When she was telling me that story, my I'm serious, my palms started sweating. I could look at a roller coaster, my palms start sweating. I have this fear of heights. and But that, what an incredible story. And through all the recovery and the physical therapy, she recovered to be an interior designer for more torture. So <laughs> God bless you, Kathleen. Your story is very inspirational. I'm glad you're here to help the listeners to start their own business and to learn from your mistakes and learn from your successes in order to help our audience. And I really do appreciate that. 
Guys, remember, if you need help with your social media marketing, wingnutsocial.com, go and check it out. Take a look at our case studies. Take a look at our reviews. We have a wait list for full service clients to resume in uh, late fall, early winter. And the reason we have a wait list is because we are awesome. The end. Mic drop. (laughs) So if you want to reserve your spot, go over to wingnutsocial.com. Check out the contact us, set up a little appointment, and we will get you situated. All right, that's it for this week. Remember to get out there, get uncomfortable, and be great. You've reached the end of this episode of Wingnut Social, but that's only the first step into accelerating your business the Wingnut way. Head on over to wingnutsocial.com to see how we can help you take your business from social mediocre to social media master. I love that. And you I, <laughs> you would rec- um sorry. <laughs> My English. Kathleen, please tell the listeners where they can go to, to <laughs> I didn't have the margarita yet, I promise. Good boy, Mango.